Embedded systems find themselves in many applications today where low power and small size are requirements, along with the ability to perform complex tasks like vision or machine learning. When is the right time for engineers to move from a microcontroller to a microprocessor for those applications so we can take advantage of their performance capabilities for these advanced tasks without sacrificing end product size or battery life? Personally, for me, when I'm doing any new design, my preference is to get a microcontroller, get my state machine up and running, write a couple of functions, you know, call those functions and, and, and have a very, very easy path to getting up and running in that design. But obviously, that's not practical for a lot of today's more complex designs. We're having to do more than just take a reading for, from a sensor and spit it out over a serial port. Um, now we're looking at things like AIML, we're looking at machine vision um, and, and all of these very complex tasks where we're stretching the end of what a microcontroller can really do. And with that, we're also seeing things like microprocessors that are capable of that starting to come down more and more in cost, coming down more and more in power consumption. And those lines between when an engineer selects a microcontroller or when they select a microprocessor, I think are getting very, very blurred. Um, so, but there's still a, a choice that has to be made is when does it make sense to take on that extra complexity, uh, the extra potential energy, and also some extra cost? Uh, how do we make that decision as engineers? Today I have the privilege of speaking with Rick Dudley, who's a business development manager for 32-bit MPUs at Microchip, about this challenge with engineers and how we make that call and the considerations that we should be thinking about as we move into the microprocessor realm in our embedded designs. Rick, thanks so much for joining me on The Current today. Thanks for having us. Uh, great to be here. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So, you know, microcontrollers and embedded systems is something that I think, you know, as electrical engineers, that's where we all cut our teeth um, in most of our control circuitry um, in, in life, uh, you know, but certainly, like I mentioned, microprocessors are coming down more and more in cost and power consumption and, and really getting into that same space. And there is an overlap now. What are some of the important things for an engineer to consider when they're looking to possibly make that move to an MPU? Well, moving to an MPU from an MCU in the AI uh, ML world really depends on a number of factors. Probably the single most largest factor is the response time that's required for a given function. Um, let's use object detection as an example real quickly here. Um, based on the number of objects you expect to detect, your library, your data set, or your library is going to be a certain size. Well, to be able to crunch through that data set quickly enough to get a response time, may not be practical in an MP MCU because of the limited space. So that gives the opportunity to move into an MPU, which has the increase in performance as well as the increase in the ability to add more uh, dynamic memory or static memory of the case of the MCU. The other challenge, right. would be, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. The other, the other challenges on, uh, on this is also the fact that depending on where the, a, the, the localized model is going to be executed, will determine, like you had mentioned before, power versus performance. Um, if you require the performance and can tolerate a little more power, and I mean, we're not talking double or triple the power, but we're talking about a 25 or 30% adder at, at runtime, sure. or a 50% or adder at standby time, an MPU still is a good fit in that space, especially if you're doing a lot of complex data set uh, searching, manipulation, those kinds of applications. Right, right. That, that makes a lot of sense and definitely a lot more to think about, a lot more considerations. And I see a lot of, you know, engineers that are moving from a Cortex-M based MCU um, and making that move to Cortex-A. In a lot of cases, what I've seen is that they're selecting instead of some of the, the lower end Cortex-A devices like an A5 and A7, A9, um, they're, they're actually go, making a big jump all the way up to an A53 processor, which a lot of times is a little bit of overkill for their app. Application. Where do you see that A5, A7 fitting in and being a better solution than some of those overkill processors that are out there? Well, again, it, it relates back to what your response time requirements are and yeah. how big a data set you're going through. So jumping all the way from an MCU to an A53, an A35, or even beyond to a, a IX, you know, a, a X, X86 type processor or an NVIDIA based yeah. processor is a huge leap where you probably don't need that application power 
at the point of the AI ML. Let's use again, we'll, we'll use object detection. If you're on a factory floor and you've got seven objects that you need to detect running across a line to make sure they're oriented properly, do you really need an, a, an a, A53 or an A35 to be able to detect? Because you've got a fixed number of data sets now you're looking at, right? It's always going to be a right. screwdriver and it always should be oriented this way, or it's a, a drill that should be oriented this way on the floor. So do you really need um, a, a, A53? Whereas an MCU might not give you the quick, the quick enough response time to detect that, oh, depending on how fast the line is moving, can it detect that, yes, the screwdriver is in the right place or the or the drill is in the right location on the thing, so the next function in that industrial line is processed correctly? Right, right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So, you know, when we're doing that, obviously, you know, if you move to something like an A5 or an A7, one of the benefits there is that you do have the MMU, so you can bring in a, a Linux or, or other full-on operating system to handle a lot of that, you know, multi-threading and, and all the other things that you might need in an application like that on a factory floor uh, to detect those different objects. Um, what's the ecosystem that Microchip provides for your A5 and A7 products to kind of make that a little bit easier for engineers? Well, we actually have two environments for development. One is an RTOS, which is our MP Lab X and Harmony platform that supports our MPUs, our 9x60, uh, ARM9, our SAM A5, and our SAM A7 platforms. So if a customer's got, let's say, already implemented an MCU um, in uh, an AI ML situation, but they need the more performance, uh, luckily, if it was done in Harmony or MP Lab X, it's an easy transition. Uh, TensorFlow Lite is already integrated, so models are available to be immediately implemented, <clears throat> already trained models are able to be implemented immediately. Now, for our Linux customers, of course, we do our own Linux distribution. As such, with the, our Linux distribution, we have already put in the different packages that would be required to execute different models, like from MobileNet or from TensorFlow Lite, um, to be integrated into their applications. And that's incredibly powerful, I think, is, you know, the fear I think I have on any project I'm working on is that if I've got, you know, if I'm trying to pull maybe a different build of Linux uh, from somewhere else, um, and I've got the hardware platform from a supplier like Microchip, and I try and integrate the two, if something doesn't work perfectly, you've got two parties that can say, no, it's their fault, no, it's their fault, um, and, and then you've got a real issue. The fact that Microchip is taking ownership of both that software ecosystem and the hardware ecosystem that seems like that's a really powerful thing in a lot of designs. Yeah, it gives the op it gives the customer one neck to choke, as a, as a phrase goes, <laughs> exactly. right? Um, and again, our 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 distribution is based on Linux's long Linux's long term release plan that they in yeah. fact they just released one here this last uh, March, um, and we just released the uh, our our latest. We do bi yearlies, so we also just released the latest long term release in our distribution as well. But that shouldn't scare a customer going, well, you know, if I start my development today, well, that means, you know, by the time I get it released in two and a half years, the long-term releases will no longer be supported. In our case, we support typically five, five long-term releases back. So that gives a customer a good opportunity to get their product in without having to keep updating their kernel during their development cycle, which in the case of a medical device or a payment device becomes very critical because if you keep changing that, you've got to go back through recertification. So this is a way for us to keep the customer moving forward and not have to worry about those particular nuances of an operating system. Right, right. You know, that, that's, that, that's, I think, a huge, powerful thing that's offered uh, to engineers there. So are there any gotchas? If, if I'm a microcontroller, you know, primarily engineer who's doing my first design moving into an MPU, any gotchas that you see, any hangups that engineers t tend to fall into or pitfalls uh, that, that engineers get into as they're making that transition? Oh, there are a number because an MCU is a relatively easy, easily implemented device, right? You apply a single voltage rail, you pull the reset line, and away you go down the road. Uh, board layouts become very simple. You really don't have any external high-speed signals to deal with, unless, of course, you've got something like an Ethernet RMI interface, of course. But those are easily handled in, in CAD designs because typically a lot of MCUs already use those kinds of technologies. But when you step up to an MPU, you end up walking into a whole different world of 
requirements from power to board layout to signal routing um, that make it a lot more complicated for the MCU engineer to move up. It's not that it's any more complicated from a, a block diagram standpoint, but it is more complicated from an electrical standpoint. So at Microchip, our goal is to reduce the time to market. And for, an, for somebody that's stepping up from an MCU to an MPU, we have, uh, I won't call them tools, but we have devices that help that. A good right. example is our system and package. Uh, the system and package already has a DDR on board, so now all your high-speed signals are internally. The only thing external would be an RMII, which is high-speed, but it's differential. All the other signals would be signal-ended, but they're all lower than 48 megahertz, so that reduces the complexity of the design. Right, right. Yeah, and that's a powerful thing. And then if you, you know, if the, if the engineer is moving into AIML, you already mentioned that you guys have TensorFlow built in. You know, where do you guys kind of see your fit in, in the, the value proposition that you have for someone that is trying to do AIML in their embedded system? What do you guys kind of offer there, and where does Microchip fit in that kind of design? Well, Microchip fits in that design, especially on the RTOS side. It fits very, very, very well in that particular space because you can you can use the MP Lab X Harmony tool chain, and and you might start out with an MCU 16 device and find out that oh, you know what? By the time I get my data set going here and what I have to process on motor control or or or, or image recognition or voice recognition, I've run my data set too large. But I can now just, with a click of the button, move from an MCU 16 to an MCU 32 or a 9x60 platform, right? Which gives you that, that right. walking progression of performance. Um, so on an MPU, what it gives you is the ability, the flexibility to have multiple things going on at the same time. Obviously, a Linux operating system with an MMU is a virtual machine, effectively. And so it gives you yep. the opportunity to try to implement multiple models to performance to increase the performance through the platform right right and and uh then what do, you know talk to me a little bit about how you compete and where you think your strength is with all of that it sounds to me like it's really the ecosystem that microchip provides but there's obviously a lot of other different options in the silicon space today all all trying to kind of go after this total market where do you think microchip really really shines for engineers uh, that are looking at AIML in their applications? Is it really that ecosystem? Is there a specific part of the ecosystem? Is it the, the, the breadth of product? Uh, well, it's a little bit of both. But, you know, again, on the Linux side for the fact that we do our own distribution and again, the one next to choke. But the other, the other side of the equation is, is if you're looking for a complete uh, MPU solution, our SAM A5, platform is really the, the sweet spot in our portfolio. Um, it gives you the ability to have something very, very low power. We're talking less than 120 milliwatts, full up running, running executing out of DDR, which there is not another device in the market that even comes close to that type of power in an MPU. Now that's that's con power consumption. Now from a right. performance standpoint, we're, we're a we're very broad at the bottom end, mid to bottom end of the market for CPU performance. Okay, um, we don't support. A good example is we don't support Android, right? Yeah. Uh, so right. we know where our limits are, and we try to focus on the embedded spaces, as you discussed earlier uh, in your opening statement. Is, is this is we're really an embedded solution at the point of presence, right? That's really where we are. We're not a large compute element. We're a localized processing element. Right, right. And, and I, I think that's, you know, the, the fact that you guys have built your space there, and it's a very large space, uh, but that strength and that focus, I think, makes you guys a great solution for engineers that are looking to get into that embedded world of AI ML um, and, and have that entire ecosystem ready to go, have a lot of different uh, types of products that they can move into uh, is, is a really, really powerful message. Um, and really appreciate, uh, appreciate you kind of giving us some insights into that. Uh, so Rick, thanks so much uh, for giving us a little bit of insights into the embedded MPUs um, and Microchip's impressive offering in this space. Um, thank you very much to our, our viewers today. Really appreciate your time joining us in the current. If you have any designs that you're looking at, if you need to talk to an engineer uh, or an expert like Rick, 
like Future Zone Advanced Engineers, uh, about where you want to take your embedded system um, and, and maybe integrate AIML, move from microcontrollers to microprocessors, which is the right one for your application. We would love to help you with that. Please feel free to reach out to us at Shaping the Future, one word, Shaping the Future at futureelectronics.com. Um, and we would absolutely love to get in touch with you um, and, and, and uh, assist you and make sure that you're getting the right product the right solutions, the right architecture, and get your product to market faster. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on The Current today. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.